I assign spousal support of $2,000 per month, as well as continuing to pay the mortgage on the house, child support of $1,000, and health insurance until the minor child reaches the age of majority. In addition, if the child attends college, you are obligated to pay these expenses as well, the judge said. This decision is going to cost me over $6,500 a month. My wife has screwed many lawyers in her firm and now they are screwing me. My name is Kurt D'Angelo and my ex-wife is Lily, short for Lillian. My daughter, my pride and joy, is named Regina. To say she's daddy's little girl would probably be an understatement. When she was free, I took her to different venues. She told the judge she wanted me to be her guardian, but he wouldn't listen to her. The whole proceedings were total crap! The monthly child support was just prohibitive. Lily was working and making money. I didn't have to support her and pay the mortgage and everything else. I was definitely being ripped off and the judge was in on it. I wasn't going to take it personally, however. In fact, I was already plotting how to make her regret the fact that she'd crossed me. I can be vindictive when I feel like I've been wronged. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, Lansing, Illinois, to be exact. We know how to hurt someone. Some people call me an entrepreneur. I simply say that I am an entrepreneur who sees opportunities and seizes them. When I was young, I have to admit that not all of these opportunities to make money were totally legitimate. Now I am in real estate, own several rental houses, vending machines, and another business that would come in handy to fulfill one of my obligations to pay back my loving wife, that is, ex-wife. I own a coin-changing business, similar to Coinstar, with machines throughout the Chicagoland area as well as northern Indiana. This would allow me to pay spousal support, all $2,000 and all change. Have her bring them to the bank. They will insist on having them all on a roll. Maybe she'll get one of her lawyer buddies to help count them and put them in sleeves. Lily stayed home with Regina until she started school. Lily then worked part-time for a few years. Then she got the idea to become a paralegal. She took courses for about two years and then went on the market with a resume trying to find a job. After about six weeks, she was hired at one of the larger law firms in the area. Lily is smart, but I now believe it was her looks, even at 32, that helped her get the job. She was one of many paralegals at the firm, but it didn't take long for her to advance. She was spotted by an up-and-coming attorney, and he made her his assistant. Now I wonder if she was self-serving in those days. I, as a foolish husband, fully supported her choice of profession. She would come home tired, but with a smile on her face. Again, remembering this, I wonder why she was exhausted and what those smiles were for. We lived in a nice house in Oak Forest, Illinois, a typical working-class suburb of Chicago. As she began to socialize more with younger lawyers and even senior partners, her attitude changed. It became, we need to move to a better neighborhood. You make good money, and I work at a prestigious law firm. We need to show the world that we are successful. I loved the house we lived in. We renovated it and made it our own. I didn't want or need to live in one of the expensive suburbs. After two years of her nagging, I agreed, but told her I wasn't selling our house, that it was our house. We could rent it out, add it to the other houses I owned. So we bought a house on the north side of Chicago in Wilmette. To afford the $900,000 mansion, as I called it, we had to take out a jumbo loan. It wasn't on the shores of Lake Michigan, but it was close enough. She furnished it with new furniture to her liking. I never felt comfortable there. In fact, thinking about it now, I think it was the beginning of the end for us. We wanted different things out of life. I wanted to be humble, the kind of millionaire next door that no one knows about. She wanted to flaunt her wealth and have that kind of lifestyle. Now back to the judge's ruling and our divorce decree. I would fulfill his requirements exactly, but she wouldn't like that. Over the next month, I started making my plans. My daughter would get child support, but Lily wouldn't see any of it. They would be in an account just for Regina, so she could get whatever she needed and wanted. She would also have health insurance the best I could find. Lily, on the other hand, was only getting catastrophic insurance. It will be a policy with a very high deductible. She will have to pay for all her medical services unless she gets deathly ill. Then the policy will kick in. After 30 days, it was time to pay Lily the first installment of spousal support. An armored truck pulled up to the mansion and the driver knocked on the door. When she appeared on the doorstep, she wasn't alone. One of her buddies was with her. The driver informed her that he was delivering the first month's payment. She was confused, not understanding why there was an armored truck parked in the driveway. 
By this time, a few curious neighbors had emerged from their McMansions. Perhaps they thought she had won the publishing house lottery. They saw two guys bring bag after bag of change into the front room and dump them out on the Italian marble floor. The sound was amazing, even from across the street where I was standing by my car recording everything on my phone. As the truck pulled away, she saw me and started yelling after me. I just waved my hand at her and yelled back, I hope you are enjoying your money, whore! I then climbed into my truck and drove off. I wasn't surprised when a man came up to me on Tuesday and asked if I was Kurt D'Angelo. I just stood there and paid him no attention. Excuse me, sir. Are you Kurt D'Angelo? He said it with more force. Once again, I didn't recognize him. He pulled out his phone and took a picture of me with the subpoena offered. When I didn't accept it, he threw it on the ground, said, You got a subpoena. Turned around and walked away. After making sure he was gone, I bent down and picked it up. I was due in court the following Wednesday. That gave me a week to finish all my preparations. I made the most of the week by calling and talking to people, making appointments, and preparing for court. I also called Regina, and we went to lunch. She was angry at her mother. She couldn't believe she had become such a bitch. She told her mother again that she wanted to live with me, but she wouldn't agree. I told her, I will go to the judge again, and if he still doesn't agree, I will probably end up in jail. Don't do anything violent, Daddy. It's not worth it, she said. Don't worry, I won't. But I'll be voicing my opinion and I could go to jail for it. Your mom will be thrilled about that, I'm sure. Don't worry about me, I can handle it. However, I've set up a trust for you. Uncle Ken will be the trustee until you reach the age of majority. He will make sure that anything you want or need will be fulfilled. But understand, your mother is not to receive any of it. It is meant for your maintenance, not hers. Of course, Daddy, she doesn't deserve anything, she said firmly. That was my girl. She had a strong will and she was becoming quite an adult. Dad, I'm going to go to court with you. I will demand that I live with you. I don't know if it's going to make a difference. It was Wednesday, and Regina, my attorney, and I were sitting on the gallery, waiting our turn in front of the judge. Lily walked in with her lawyer buddy and said, Hey, jerk, you better follow the program. You can't do everything you want to do, you'll see. When the judge called my name, Regina stood up and walked to the podium first. Excuse me, miss, this is a case involving Kurt D'Angelo, said the judge. I'm his daughter, and I want to petition the court to have custody of my father and not that bitch, my mother, she said and looked at Lily. Young lady, you will not talk like that in my courtroom. Your custodial parent has already been determined. But I'm 15 years old. I should have the right to choose who I want to be with, she demanded, interrupting the judge. Well, there were allegations of an inappropriate relationship with your father, so I ruled in favor of your mother. Hearing that, I looked at Lily and a smirk appeared on her face. My counsel came forward and said, Your Honor, we are not aware of any charges or that they were made or presented to the court at any previous hearing. I refer to the psychiatrist's report I received. With this information, I stand by my opinion, so this matter is closed. About four months before, Regina had been going through a bad divorce, as well as problems at school, so we decided to take her to a psychiatrist. There must have been something in those records that Lily felt would sway the judge in her favor. I never had any inappropriate activities with my daughter. Lily tried to paint me as a pedophile. My blood pressure was up. I couldn't believe that Lily could lie like that, accusing me of something I hadn't done. The judge wouldn't even let me make my point. I stared at the judge. He's going to pay for this. I guess her law firm handled everything. Let's see what happens in the end. My vindictive nature was starting to kick in. Lily's attorney spoke up and said, We ask the court to find Kurt D'Angelo guilty of contempt of court. My lawyer was almost as hot as I was. He saw that there would be no justice in this courtroom today. Your Honor, my client has complied with all the terms of the divorce decree to date. There are no grounds for contempt of court. Your Honor, Attorney Lily said, at this time, my client has not received child support from Mr. D'Angelo. That is correct, Your Honor, my attorney stated. The child support was given directly to his daughter for any wants and needs she may have. You can ask her about that yourself. The judge was confused. He looked at Regina and she smiled, nodding her head. We have canceled checks for insurance and mortgage, 
my lawyer said. I looked at Lily and her lawyer. They were trying to think of something. Your Honor, he said. Paying in change is causing my client an absolutely intolerable hardship. Can we ask that she be given a check in the future? The judge, finally managing to get a word in, said, That seems reasonable. Before he could say anything else, my attorney spoke. Your Honor, before you continue talking about this, could you answer a couple of questions pertaining to this? And what would that be? he asked. Is the Chicago Police Department part of the legal system of the city of Chicago? The judge looked at my lawyer like he was crazy and said, Of course you are. Why then, my attorney continued, if my client has his car impounded and wants to drive it out of a Chicago police impound lot, he can't write a check but has to pay with cash or a credit card? The judge stuttered, uh, my attorney continued, if the police, by your own admission part of the Chicago legal system, refuse to accept a check, how can my client be required to pay future spousal maintenance in the form of a check? The judge, who now looked like a buffoon, became defensive and said, because this is my court, and what I say is what will happen. At this point, I had had enough. I stood up and said, Because you're the law, and you're trying to please my wife's law firm. Was she a whore to you too? And then he exploded. Mr. D'Angelo, I find you in contempt of court and sentence you to six months in the Cook County Jail unless you apologize to me and the court and agree to any conditions I impose. Who are you? The king? The king of this kangaroo court, shouted I. The judge was shocked. I'm sure he'd never been spoken to like that before. Bailiff, take this man into custody. I looked at Lily and her lawyer. They were stunned. Good luck getting money for whores, bitch, I said, then smiled. She didn't know yet how much her life would change. I was taken to a cell, strip searched and transferred to prison. Prison is a good word. It's more like a prison. Immediately, two guards started questioning me about the disrespect I had shown to the judge. I wasn't afraid of prison. I'm 6'4 tall and weigh about 255 pounds. Working on rental properties kept me in shape. I also did a little time in juvie as a teenager. I was processed and escorted to the cell yard. I ignored all the talking and shouting. I was determined to stay in the shadows and always be on guard. As long as no one messed with me, I would be a ghost. When the evening meal was served, I took my tray and made my way through the line. I stood against the wall and ate, looking around at the scumbags who were trying to pretend to be something more than they were. Then, out of the noise, I heard a voice I hadn't heard in literally decades. Tex? My friends on the street called me Tex from back in the days when I was a juvenile delinquent. Tex? Randall, also known as Ringer, said. What the hell are you doing here? As he approached, many eyes followed him and turned to me. I set the tray down and hugged him, interlocking my right arms between me and my other arm around his shoulders. Ringer! Wow, you're a handsome man. How the hell are you doing? Well, I'm here, so not so good. You're probably not either. What did you do? Basically told the judge he was an asshole. That will be enough, he said. So how long are you here for? Six months if I don't apologize to the son of a bitch. So, six months, I guess. We talked and ate, and some of the prisoners looked at us. Ringer told me about the situation in the prison. He said he would watch my back, and I agreed. We talked about old times. So, what are you going to do about the ex, her lovers, and the judge? He asked after I told him everything. He knew me from my younger years. Revenge had always been part of my behavior back then. In fact, that's why I got the nickname Tex. Tex is short for Texas, meaning don't mess with Texas. Those who did mess with it, they paid. They'll think twice before they cross me, and they'll tell others about it. So, Judge? What happened there? He asked. I told him he's basically a piece of shit. Oh, shit. What did he do? He asked. He took my little girl away from me even though she asked to live with me and then accused me of molesting her. Oh, shit. What are you going to do about it? I have some plans. I kind of knew I was going to be here, so I started planning a few weeks ago. Is there anything I can help you with? He asked. Maybe, but right now I don't know. It sure is nice to have a friend here, though. 
I'll introduce you to some of my buddies. It's good to have people who have your back and who you can rely on. After some introductions, Ringer started telling some stories about running around the streets of Lansing. There were a few chuckles, but mostly nods, as if their stories weren't much different from each other. That night I lay in my bunk, staring at the wall. How did it get to this point? I asked myself. I began to review my life. My childhood was rough by most people's standards. My father was an abusive drunk, and my mom had no backbone at all, even when my dad started hitting me. Because of this, I spent most of my time on the streets. I met a group of guys who were in a similar situation. We weren't a gang, even though we pretended to be. We were just stupid kids dealing with the problems we had. The crime rate in Lansing is pretty high, and we didn't help that statistic. Mostly minor stuff, but we did steal a car a couple times. That's what got me into prison. Looking back, it was the best thing that happened to me. Sure, it was hard, but I had time to think about the direction my life was going. I vowed to myself that I would do something with my life. When I got out, I changed, I started planning for the future. By the time I was 20, I had saved enough money to buy a house in my neighborhood that had been foreclosed on. It became the first of many houses I renovated and started renting out. When I was 22 years old, I was in a club trying to catch a lucky break. I don't even remember the name of that club. It changed names so many times over the following decade, and then it was torn down to make way for condos. That night I was really lucky, at least I thought so at the time. I met Lily. We hit it off. Her life was very different from mine. She had just moved to Chicago to live with a friend. She grew up in Seymour, Indiana. Seymour is a small town best known as the hometown of John Cougar Mellencamp. By the time Lily was born, he had already become famous and moved away, so she never even met him. Growing up in a small Midwestern town produced a 21-year-old woman with an attitude toward life that I found appealing. I guess opposites attract. We married a year later, and the year after that Regina was born, named after Lily's mom. I bought a house in Oak Forest to rent out, but when she saw it, she loved it and wanted to make it our home. We spent the next 10 years fixing it up the way we wanted. It was the best 10 years of my life. We worked on home projects together, watched our daughter grow up, and invited the neighbors over for barbecues. It was the American dream. Then Lily got a job at a law firm, and things began to change, mostly her attitude toward life. The simple life no longer suited her. She needed expensive clothes, jewelry, and neighborhood barbecues were replaced by trips to expensive restaurants, often with people from her law firm. She also began making derogatory statements about the people of Chicago's South Side. I know the reputation and reality of the South Side, but she was a country girl who acted like she was better than everyone else. We fought more than once over this attitude. Soon after that, she started urging me to move to the North Side all the time. Three years ago, we moved. Of course, the school system was better, but now Regina felt the attitude of her North Side classmates. It made her school life unbearable. She kept saying she wanted to go back home. So did I, but Lily never heard anything about it. She was where she wanted to be. The event that started the divorce was an evening like many others at the time. She called around 6.30 and said she was going to a dance with other paralegals from her job. However, that evening I tracked her cell phone and decided to check on her. I stood in the shadows and watched her. Sure enough, she was dancing, but with the guys from the club. They were flanking her like she was a free-for-all. They were doing anything but having sex on the dance floor. At about 9.15, I had to go to the bathroom to relieve myself. While I was doing my business in the stall, a guy came in and started peeing at the urinal. When he was done, another guy walked in. Damn, Joe, you're getting turned on with Lily on the dance floor. I thought you were going to do it right there. Yeah, she's a wild one, said the first guy. You know it. She said she's coming home with me tonight. We can finally have some proper fun instead of 20 minutes at the office or in the back seat of my car. Yes, it's nice for immediate relief, but it doesn't compare to the sexual experience, the other guy said. Well, we're going to work all night tonight, the first guy bragged. Maybe next weekend it will be my turn, said the other guy as they both left the restroom. I know guys like to talk, but this sounded more real than just bragging. I came out of the restroom a minute late to see her in the arms of one of the guys making out on the dance floor. Around 9.30, she texted me that she had a little too much alcohol and didn't feel comfortable in her state of mind going to the L so late at night. She texted me that she was going to spend the night with Paula, one of the other paralegals in her office. 
I texted her back, that too. She then wrote back, I'm sorry. She would be sorry. I watched her grab her purse and walk out of the club, holding hands with a young lawyer from her office. I followed them. They were so engrossed in each other that she didn't notice me. They jumped into his Lexus and kissed and groped each other for a few minutes. I started to get angry, but then my south side vindictiveness took over, and I calmed down, making my plans. I followed them to his building. They pulled into the parking lot, and I headed for the mansion. When I arrived, I explained to Regina that we were leaving, and that she should pack everything she wanted because we weren't coming back. She was excited, but asked, What about Mom? There are other guys taking care of her now. She understood exactly what I meant. It took us about three hours, but we packed everything into the back of my truck. Fortunately, our house in Oak Forest had recently vacated, so we had a place to go. Around 11 o'clock the next day, Saturday, she called my cell phone. Kurt, what's going on? Where are you? Home, was all I said. It only took her a couple seconds to realize what I meant. Why, she asked, knowing perfectly well why. I don't know you anymore and I don't want to know you. Where's Regina? With me, she doesn't want to live with you in this house anymore. I know she wasn't sure if I knew anything about her buddy or not, so she said, Come on, Kurt. If you don't like living in luxury, it doesn't mean you're just going to walk away and take our daughter with you. No, Lily, but a wife having fun with me is a reason to leave. Expect divorce papers next week. She sighed, then said in her usual derogatory manner, You Southsider piece of shit. You have no idea what hell you're bringing upon yourself. My firm will eat you up! That may be true, I said, but in the end I will prevail. You have not yet seen my full wrath. For the next six months she made no attempt at reconciliation. She even called me to tell me that she was seeing one lawyer or another. I didn't care, there was no turning back. I had to get Regina back, but to do that she had to go back to school. Regina informed me that Lily was out almost every night until at least 12 o'clock noon. She also told me that she was constantly rebuking me, telling me that I had no class and that Regina should aim to get one of the rich guys from her school as a future husband so you could live in luxury for the rest of your life. Regina always defended me and told my mom she wanted to go back to Oak Forest. Now I'm lying here in jail, and Lily probably thinks she won. I was in jail, but I'll work. I wonder if she thought about how she was going to pay the mortgage, health insurance, and of course, spousal support. She certainly thought a few days in jail would make me come to my senses. No, they would just give me more time to plan and carry out my revenge. Something happened Thursday afternoon that will change the lives of many people, some of whom I will never meet. Two guards ordered me to come with us. I was taken to a video conference room. I asked, what is this? If I am going to speak to the judge, I want my lawyer to be present. They pushed me into the room and said, sit down. You will not talk to the judge, but you will be sentenced. They slammed the door and I started screaming for them to let me out. After about 10 minutes, I was thrashing around the room when the door opened and the guards let six cellmates into the room. I knew what they were going to try and I was going to do everything I could to make sure it didn't happen. You shouldn't mess with me, I declared. You'll regret it. One of them jumped at me and I punched him right in the nose. I heard it crack. Then they all rushed at me. I swung back, kicked, elbowed, and pinned them against the walls. Then the biggest of them, six inches taller than me, took me in a chokehold. I kept punching until I lost consciousness. I woke up in the infirmary. I was bloody, bruised, and my ass was on fire. I knew what they had done. They needed to establish dominance, and that's how they did it. I realized by the light coming through the window that it was morning. I had been out all night. When the nurse approached me, I looked at her with hatred in my eyes. Hatred for this whole system that could take my child from me. Make me pay so my ex-wife could continue to live in the mansion. And finally put me in jail to teach me a lesson. The nurse looked at me. I was tied up so I couldn't move my arms or legs. Seeing the hatred in my eyes, she said, I am here to help you, not to hurt you. You've been beaten up badly. They said you got into a fight, but we both know the truth. I can either help you get better, or you can lie here and suffer. There's no difference for me. I realized she said the last words, but didn't really mean them. She wanted to help. I tried to smile and said, sorry. You've been through a traumatic event. 
I can only imagine your rage. She left, but came back with a plate of breakfast for me. She unclenched one of my hands. Thank you, said I. You're welcome. As I sat and ate, I knew what I was going to do. Can I ask a favor, said I? It depends on the situation, she replied. One of the prisoners, Randall Turner, is a friend of mine that I grew up with. May I invite him to join me? We'll see, she said in an indifferent tone. It turned out that she had managed to get permission to visit Ringer. Later that afternoon, he came to see me. When he saw me, he said, oh, shit. He knew I wouldn't let it go unnoticed. I described the six guys and two guards who did this to me. Then I said, I need to know the full names of all eight of them, not their nicknames. Oh, shit, he repeated. What are you going to do? An eye for an eye, but with a twist. He saw my look and knew what it meant. He knew it wouldn't be pretty and that innocent people would pay. I'll try to get them, he said. What do you want from me? Just that, I'll take care of the rest. We talked some more and then he was escorted back to his cell. Sleep that night was restless. I couldn't get comfortable, strapped to the bed. The next day, Ringer came back with the list. He asked again, What are you going to do? The less you know, the better, I told him. Oh shit, he said. The next day was Sunday and I got a good and bad surprise. Lily arrived and brought Regina. Lily was the first person to talk to me. So I see you have found common ground with your fellow misfits, she said. What the hell do you want? I growled. Regina insisted we come to you. Are you ready to apologize and be reasonable yet? No way! And what is this shit about me and Regina? You know I'd never do anything to her? How do I know? She's unusually attached to you, she said. You're a piece of shit! Why don't you go back to your buddies and have them look up your ass so you can see how much shit is in you? Just so you know. It's happened before and they loved it. She gloated. Get the hell out of here and send Regina here. I'm sick of talking to you. She was smiling the way only a nasty bitch could smile. She thought she'd gotten me, and she had, just adding fuel to the fire that would burn her ass. When they brought Regina in, she cried when she saw me lying there with bandages all over me. Honey, don't cry. Things look worse than they are. Oh, Daddy. I was scared when I saw you lying there like that. You look like you've been in an accident. Don't worry about me, sweetheart. I'm tougher than I look. Dad, I hate Mom for doing that to you. I hate her for making me live with her, and I hate her for saying you did inappropriate things to me. That's total bullshit. I know Regina, I said, trying to comfort her. Don't call me that again, she said. I looked at her, perplexed. I'm Gina from now on. I don't want to be associated with my mom or anyone in her family. That's what I told her, and then I declared that I wouldn't talk to her again if I didn't have to. And I haven't since Monday. She keeps trying to be nice to me, but I keep ignoring her. Gina, I said, using her new name. You look more like me than you realize. I couldn't be prouder? she said, smiling. We talked some more about little things. Then I asked, could you do something for me? Anything. Dad. I handed her the list Ringer had made for me, and she immediately put it in her bra. Give this to Uncle Ken and tell him to come and see me as soon as possible. My brother Ken was three years younger than me. He grew up with the same abusive drunken father, but I protected him as best I could. I also took the brunt of the abuse to keep him safe. He had all the brains. He got really into computer games and then moved on to computers themselves. We sat and talked for a little while longer until Lily came back and said, Regina, we have to go. Gina didn't say anything to her, just got up, gave me a hug and walked away. Lily said to me, Your daughter is just as stubborn as you are. I just smiled at her and she turned and walked away. On Tuesday, Ken came to visit. He was shocked at my appearance. Looks much better than last Friday, I said. I'm glad I waited, he said jokingly. Then he spoke to me in our own made-up language. We created it as kids to talk about mom and dad in ways they wouldn't understand. Now when we need to talk in private, we use it. Regina, I'm sorry, Gina, he said in our language. 
She gave me a list. I did some preliminary research. What are you looking for? Addresses of wives or regular girlfriends. He looked at me and then said in English, Oh, shit. Speaking our language, I said, That's all you have to do. Then give it to Gummy and ask him to visit me without the list. Gummy is the nickname of one of my gang members. Ken knew he still lived in his parents' old house in the Lansing neighborhood. I can do that. Anything else? No, that will be enough. But don't be a stranger. I could use a familiar face now and then. Aren't you going out soon? He asked. Not if I don't apologize and you know me better than that. You've always been stubborn, he stated. Yeah, and it kept you from your father's drunken wrath, I said. He realized I was right and just smiled. I'll stop by in the next two weeks to see if you need anything else. That would be great. That same week I went back to my regular cell, and Ringer informed me that things were going to go south and that there would be a price to pay. They just didn't know what for. The looks I was getting from the two guards as well as the six said, You better stay where you are or it will happen again. They didn't know yet that they were the ones who were going to be put in their place. Gummy came to visit and said to me, Ken gave me this. What do you want? Did you hear what they did to me? Yeah, I heard, he said. Ken must have told him. Return the favor, but to their loved ones. Just no DNA? Use Steely Dan or his more flexible cousins, said I. He nodded. He understood what I meant. Then I said, all on the same day, preferably at the same time. Make sure they tell their loved ones, don't mess with Texas. I'll get my friends to help, he said and walked away. Someday he would avenge me. He knew how to do it in such a way that they wouldn't be able to identify anyone. But they would know the reason. A week passed, but I heard nothing. I was also waiting for another visit from my daughter. I didn't want to see Lily, but I knew she had to be here if Gina came. Tuesday morning, I noticed that two security guards were not at work. Tuesday was not usually a day off for them. In addition, one of the six was distracted and looked upset. It must have happened yesterday, I thought to myself. I talked to Ringer and asked him to tell him, don't mess with Tex. Soon, several prisoners began to address me. Hey, Tex! After a couple of days, the sixes started throwing angry glances at me. Two of the guards went back to work and glared at me. Ringer's friends, however, had my back. When one of the sixes approached me, eight of my new friends came up and surrounded us. The guy said, You're a piece of shit. I don't know how you did it, but my girlfriend dumped me. She told me she didn't want to risk getting hurt again. Then she said, I was told, don't mess with Texas. I just looked at him, smiled, and said, That sounds like good advice. I told you all that you shouldn't do what you did. Now your women know how it feels. An eye for an eye with a twist. The twist is that you hurt me, and I hurt those you care about. Tell them all that next time it will be their mothers. His eyes got big and he turned back to his buddies. Shortly afterward, two guards came up to me and said, Who do you think you are? We are going to make your stay here a living hell. Well, then I guess your wives better get used to being taken in the ass. They might even enjoy it. After that, one of the guards approached me to hit me. I did not resist. A minute or two after he let him beat me, he was dragged away by another guard. Many prisoners witnessed this. I'm sure the cameras saw it too. I was brought back to the infirmary and met Beth, the nurse who helped me the first time. So, we've got a troublemaker here, huh? I didn't throw any punches. The guard just started hitting me, said I. There will be an investigation this time. There were too many witnesses. He will probably lose his job because of it. One less asshole security guard, I said. These guards are keeping you safe, believe it or not. He certainly didn't keep me safe last time. More than that, he let it happen, I replied. She bandaged me up and told me I would have to stay overnight for observation. I wondered if she just wanted to look at my pretty face, which was pretty wrinkled. The guard was suspended from work pending the investigation. The other guard kept throwing stern glances at me, but didn't dare say anything to me. Perhaps he realized, don't mess with Texas. Gina hadn't come to see me in three weeks, and I kept wondering what was going on. Ken finally came in and told me that Lily was refusing to bring Gina to visit. That pissed me off even more. My ex-wife was hiding my daughter from me. 
Lily arrived at the end of the month. She had almost left Gina at home, but Gina wouldn't get out of the car no matter how much she screamed and yelled. Lily came in to see me and was already furious. Your daughter is acting impossible. She hardly ever talks to me. She's just as stubborn as you are. You said that last time you were here. Why don't you ask the judge to reverse his decision and hand her over to me? I'd be happy to take her off your hands, I told her. You're not getting her! She needs to go to a good school so she can accomplish something. Oak Forest is a good school and she loved it there, I told her. It's not even close to Wilmette. She's getting a great education and meeting people who can help her in the future, she replied. Our daughter will make her own way in life. She doesn't need to ride on someone else's coattails, I objected. You're just so stubborn that you can't see any good it can do. Lily, we've argued about this a hundred times. You're never going to change my mind, and I'm not going to change yours. Why did you come here in the first place? I know it wasn't to bring Gina to me. Her name is Regina, not Gina. Well, that's not what she wants to be called. Don't you want her to be an independent woman? You mean stubbornness? said Lily. No, I mean independent. Able to think for herself, to decide what's right for her, not go along with a guy with money or power. Or maybe Big Stick. She looked at me and grinned. She knew that last comment was meant for her. Anyway, that's it. She said, I need spousal support payments. I need to buy things and pay bills. Well, you'll have to pay for them out of your paycheck. I can't get checks from my S-Corp while I'm incarcerated, and I don't have to. No job, no paycheck. That's how it works in the real world. What do you mean? I can't pay all the bills on my paycheck. Well, you should have thought of that before taking me to court, I replied. Well, you acted like a jackass by paying in change. Well, now you won't get paid because I'm in jail. You must, she said. No, I don't. What are they going to do to me? Put me in jail if I don't. Oh, I'm already in jail. It wouldn't be very wise of them to get me out to throw me back in. What am I going to do about the bills? She whined. I looked at her and said, Get one of your lawyer buddies to pay the bills. I'm sure you deserve it. With those words, she ran out of the room. Gina came in. I was so happy to see her. Wow, you really pissed her off, she said. She expects me to keep paying her spousal support while I'm in jail. Ha, huh, good luck with that, said I. How are you holding up, Dad? Don't worry about me, I'll be fine. How are you doing? I hear you're still not talking to your mom. Not very often, just when I have to, she said. So when are you getting out of here? Honey, I refuse to apologize to that asshole judge. I'll only apologize if he gives you back to me. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I probably won't get out of here until my six months is up. I understand, she said sadly. You know it's my birthday next month. I'd like you to come out so we can celebrate, but I don't want you to go against your principles. We can celebrate when you come out. It was tearing me apart. I began to reconsider my position. By being here, I was hurting my little girl. Then Gina said something that put things into perspective. If a man has no principles, he has nothing. As Abraham Lincoln said, important principles can and should be unbending, she pronounced. Where did you hear that? I asked. My counselor, Alex, sorry, Dr. Hodges, is at school. It's great to have someone to talk to about all of this. Some of my teachers noticed that my grades were going down and asked the counselor to come and talk to me. It also helped me deal with my mom, although I still don't talk to her. In a school system like Wilmette, the counselor could be a doctor of psychology. These rich kids couldn't go to just any school counselor. Then I said to Gina, your mom seems to be mad at you too. Yeah, she's starting to annoy me. I just ignore her. I think it makes it worse, and I don't care. Well, in a couple more months, she'll have to start looking for a place to live. The bank won't let the jumbo loan go unpaid for too long. I think her mansion will be foreclosed on within three months. But Dad, if the house gets foreclosed on, won't that ruin your reputation? Honey, when you usually buy things with cash, you don't worry about credit. That stupid mansion was the only thing I took out a loan for. Really? 
Wow, Dad, even with all your leases and other businesses, you've never taken out a loan? Use the money from the others to buy new ones, I told her. Daddy, I've always respected you, but now I respect you even more. She said it with a smile on her face. Thank you, dear. You really know how to lift my spirits. It was a wonderful visit with my daughter. Really, I wanted to be with her on a more regular basis. Besides, missing her birthday would be hard on both of us. But I knew she would be fine. She is a strong child. The next week, I found out that the security guard who hit me had been fired. It was hard to object to a videotape that didn't even show me defending myself. A few days later, the other guard quit as well. I don't know if he was transferred or not, but at least he left. Several inmates thanked me for getting rid of the rotten guard. I think I gained some respect with that. Now more people were calling me Tex. I didn't have much trouble after that. The six were still mad at me. I heard that one of their wives had filed for divorce, and three others had been dumped by their girlfriends. Maybe stupid people can learn? Given the threat of more reprisals, and the fact that my standing among the other prisoners had improved, they knew they were better off doing nothing. A couple weeks later, I received a subpoena to go to the video room to meet with the judge. I told the guard who came to pick me up that I would not meet with anyone without a lawyer. But the judge is already waiting, he said. I don't care. I want my lawyer. Have him reschedule. My calendar is open. The guard hesitated, then turned and walked away. Three days later, I was informed that the meeting was scheduled for the following week. I asked that the lawyer and I have half an hour before the meeting to confer. They set it up, and the lawyer and I met to discuss what was going to happen. My lawyer told me he was not given any information about the meeting, which seemed odd to him. I guess we'll play it by the circumstances. When the judge showed up on the videotape, I could tell he wasn't happy about being put off for a week. But I didn't care. In my mind, he was a piece of shit who thought he was better than others just because he was a judge. My attorney spoke almost immediately. Your Honor, may I ask what this refers to? We didn't get any information. We were just told to be here. Your client didn't need to involve you, he said. I just wanted to know if he was willing to apologize to the court for his outburst. The lawyer looked at me and I gestured to him. He leaned over and I whispered in his ear. Your Honor, my attorney said. He is unwilling to apologize and asks that you apologize to him. He also asks that you grant him primary custody of the child. Judge looked shocked. How could I ask him to apologize? Of course he wouldn't do that. My decision regarding the child stands and I have nothing to apologize for, he said. Well, then we've wasted our time. If in the future my client decides to change his mind, we will request an audience at this time. Good day, sir. And one more thing, the judge said. I thought, now we'll know the real reason for the meeting. Your client is not honoring a divorce decree. When does he plan to make the required spousal maintenance and mortgage payments? My lawyer leaned toward me, and I whispered in his ear again. Your Honor, he doesn't plan to make any payments while he's in custody. But his house will be foreclosed on, the judge said. It's not my house, maybe my wife's mansion, but it's not my house. I never wanted to own it, I said bluntly to the judge. It will ruin your credit and you will lose all your equity, he said. A small price to pay to see my favorite ex-wife walking down the street where she belongs, said I. Then I said something I knew would piss him off. Perhaps all her buddies can make the payments. I'm sure you all can find the money together. I knew that by insinuating that my wife was a whore and he was one of her lovers, he would fly into a rage. You worthless piece of shit, Southside scum. Who do you think you're talking to? I interrupted him as he was about to continue. I think I'm talking to the man who partook of my wife's body. If I'm wrong, I apologize. I just can't understand why someone who isn't in the game would care so much. With these words, I got up and went to the door to be let out. I heard the judge say, Counselor, your client just earned himself two extra months in jail. If he continues to disrespect me, I will make his life a living hell. I smiled, waiting for the guard who was supposed to return me to my cell. I realized he was listening because he had a stunned expression on his face. He couldn't believe what I had just done. When I got back to my cell, I was on edge. Apparently, my wife had blabbed about the mortgage to her buddies, who in turn had talked to the judge. 
what a goddamn rat's nest. Their time will come soon enough. The next Sunday, Lily couldn't resist coming to visit me in jail. Luckily, Gina found out about it and made her bring her along. I heard you pissed off the judge again and got two more months in jail. When are you going to learn? You can't fight the system. Lily, why don't you just talk to me anymore? All you're doing is trying to show your attitude toward Northside. I don't need that. All I need is for you to make sure Gina visits me regularly. She practically screamed, It's Regina! I turned away and didn't speak to her. She just kept cursing. Finally, she left and Gina came in. When she walked in, she had a huge smile on her face. I asked her why she was so happy. Because I'm going to see my daddy, she said. It can't be the only reason, I said. I have a surprise for you, but I can't tell you what it is yet until I think it through. Dad, do you trust me? With my life, said I. Then will you sign this paper without reading it first? She held out a folded piece of paper. I looked at her warily. What are you up to? You'll have to wait and see. I thought you trusted me. I smiled at her and signed the paper. She folded it so that only the spot where she wanted to write my name was visible. Mom said you did something to get your sentence extended for another two months. Is that true? Yes, I'm sorry, darling. What did you do? Confronted the judge again. Well, whatever you did, he probably deserved it. We talked a little more about school and her mom. She kept talking about this Dr. Alex Hodges thing and wondering what was going on. I tried to get her to tell me about her plans for my signing, but she said it should remain a surprise. I'm sorry I won't be at your 16th birthday party, but the next time you come to see me, I'll have a birthday present for you. What is it? she asked. It's a surprise. So I guess we're both in for surprises, said I. At the end of the visit, I asked Gina to invite Greg to join me. Greg was my right-hand man. He helped me with all my business matters. Of course, Daddy, she said. I assigned Greg a few specific cases when I thought I was going to jail. I hope he did well with them. Now I had one more job for him, a surprise birthday party for Gina. At the end of that week, Greg came to visit us. He had actually managed to do quite a lot of the things I had asked him to do. Then I asked him to prepare a surprise for Gina for her birthday. He looked at me and said, Are you sure? Yes. It's the perfect gift for her. Okay, I'll talk to our lawyer, he said. Also, visit my brother Ken and give him what you have. He'll know what to do with it. If he has any questions, have him come to me. If not, let him go to gummies. Will do, he said and left. I just smiled and kept the smile on my face all day. Gummy knew my devious mind and was going to get back at me while I was guilt-free in jail. By the end of the month, my popularity among the prisoners had grown. A guard must have told someone how I treated the judge, and, as in any other organization, word spread among the prisoners. Pretty soon everyone was calling me Tex. Also, towards the end of the month, I had a visitor. I went into the room and saw Lily sitting there. I was about to turn around and leave when she said, Kurt, please stop. I need to talk to you. I have nothing to say to you, Lily, I replied. We're going to lose our house. You have to give me some money to stop the foreclosure, she pleaded. This is your house, Lily. I never wanted it, but you kept nagging me until I gave in. This house means nothing to me, and in a falling market, we don't have any equity. Let the bank take it. Kurt, you can't do this. You have to help me. Go and ask your buddies for help. I'm sure they have enough money. Then you can really become the whore you are. Why are you doing this to me? She cried. Why did you lie and tell the judge I was molesting our daughter? She didn't know what to say. She realized she had done me wrong. She cried and I left. It felt good to let it all out. As I was being led back to my cell, the guard got a call to bring me back. When I walked in, expecting to see Lily sitting there crying and begging me to help her again, I was surprised to see Gina. Gina, your mom didn't tell me she brought you. I wouldn't let her come without me, she said. I'm sorry I missed your birthday, I said. But I have a present for you nonetheless. Dad, I knew you'd miss me and I don't care. I love you anyway. And you don't have to give me a present, she said.
What a wonderful daughter I have, I thought. I don't have it with me, nor is it possible, but I can tell you what it is. Gina, the house in Oak Forest belongs to you. It goes into trust for you when you become of age. When I get out of here, can I stay there? Of course I'll pay your rent. Her eyes widened, and a huge smile appeared on her face. Daddy, my God, you just removed a huge obstacle that was keeping you from being surprised. I still can't tell you, but when I do, you'll understand. I love you so much. I love you too, honey. I was puzzled as to what this surprise was. It must have something to do with our home, not the mansion, but our real home. We both smiled as we continued our conversation. She started talking about Alex, her counselor, again. I wondered if she had a crush on him. I hoped he was professional and had no ulterior motives towards her. I would have to meet this Alex guy as soon as I got out of here. As I was led back to my cell, I had a huge smile on my face, both because of the verbal battle with Lily and the wonderful conversation with Gina. The other inmates were perplexed as to what I had done. They already knew that a smile meant someone was hurt. Gummy came to visit me one day. It was all set. A video of my wife, other paralegals at her firm, some of them married, and prostitutes being entertained by most of the lawyers at the firm, as well as up-and-coming Democratic politicians and a certain judge I knew all too well. They all bragged about being above the law and being able to do whatever they wanted. Surprisingly, people don't pay attention to hired servants. Janitors can come and go as they please. For someone who does the chore of cleaning offices after hours, money talks. Free rent for a year speaks volumes. We had them install hidden cameras in conference rooms and offices. I knew I'd get enough evidence to upset a few lives. My brother, anonymously of course, would post videos online with the slogan, Don't Mess With Texas. They would send them to strategic websites and send the videos to every news outlet and tabloid in the state. The various publications would be in a frenzy to see who could create more news out of this. Politicians and lawyers will be frantically trying to undo the fallout. I smiled and said, In a week's time, go and let the others know what should happen next. He said, I will. As I walked back to my cell, I had another wide smile on my face. Ringer saw it and realized that I had just talked to Gummy. He said, Holy shit! I just nodded and smiled even wider. I was lying in my bunk when the videotapes came out, and I could hear the murmurings going around the prison. Apparently, somehow the news had reached our little corner of hell. I began to hear people openly say, Don't mess with Texas. A few minutes later, I was surprised when a big guy, one of the six, came into my cell and said, You're a bad bastard. I'm sorry for what I did to you. I told you all that you shouldn't mess with me. That you would regret it. Now more and more people regret contacting me. I return kindness for kindness and violence for violence. I hope you'll accept my apology. Sure, just remember that just because you're big doesn't mean you can't hurt yourself. He nodded and walked away. About three days later, I was called before the judge again. He had already called my lawyer and he was on his way. We sat in the video room while we waited for the judge to connect. I wonder what this is about, he said with a smirk. Only time will tell, said I with a smirk on my face. Oh shit, he said. When the judge came on stage, he looked at me with fire in his eyes. You did it, he shouted. What are you talking about, said I in an impassive voice. You're Tex, aren't you, he was still yelling. Some people call me that, I said calmly. You're going to pay for this he shouted again. I've been in jail for the last four months. How could I have done anything? I said, not paying attention. You have friends. We all have friends, Your Honor, I said sarcastically. You're not getting away with this, he spat. I don't know, Judge. You may be out of a job soon, and I hear your wife is divorcing you. You better call off your dogs, he demanded. Now you're calling my friends dogs? I'm not sure they'd appreciate that. You know, if you corner a dog, you might get bitten. Are you threatening me? He asked. No, just repeating the old adage, I said. I'm going to make your life a living hell. When you ever get out of this slimy prison, you better be on your guard. One day you're going to have to answer to people who don't care about your life. And I'll be happy no matter what they do to you.
Then he cut the transmission. I turned to my lawyer. Did you get this? Sure, he said, holding out the phone. More fuel to the fire. The Bar Association will be interested to hear this. Apparently, in Illinois, intimidation is a criminal offense. A few days later, another visitor came to see me. It was my wife again. Oh, it's you. I thought I made it clear to you that I had nothing more to say to you. You bastard! She shouted. What are you talking about? I asked calmly. You got me fired! My picture is all over the news and the internet. How could you do this to me? She whined. You did it yourself, said I. Do you hate me that much? Yeah, and all your law buddies who think they're better than everyone else. I spat back. I continued. When we first met, you were a sweet small-town girl with a great personality. Now you're just an uptown bitch who loves no one but herself. What am I going to do? I don't have a job, and no one will hire me now. Move back to Seymour and live with your folks, I suggested. I can't. The local paper had a headline local girl at center of Chicago scandal. My parents are going to take early retirement and move to Florida to avoid all this talk. Looks like Florida is the right place for you. You'll be a lot farther away from me. They don't want to receive me. They hardly want to talk to me. Wow, your parents barely want to talk to you, and your daughter barely talks to you. Maybe it's you? I said. I think you should move and start over. But you better not take Gina with you. As soon as I leave here, I'll come back and petition the court for primary custody. I think with your reputation, they'll reconsider you as the best moral example for an impressionable girl. You can't do that, she said. She's all I have left. Lily, I don't care! You did this to yourself. We had a good life, and then you started having fun with everyone. Hey, that's a thought. You could be a whore for one of your lawyer buddies. I'm sure there's a market for an almost 40-year-old ass. She looked at me. There was nothing but pain in her eyes. She put her forehead on the table in front of her and just cried. Sucks to be you, said I. Then I asked, Did you bring Gina? She practically exploded, declaring, It's Regina! And no, she's doing something with this doctor friend of hers. Well, then I have nothing more to say to you. Don't come back unless you bring Gina. I turned and walked away as she was still furious. There was no smile on my face this time. I actually felt sorry for her. She was broken. The next day I saw a night report. Apparently the top floor of a five-story office building in the center of town had caught fire. Thanks to the sprinkler system, the bottom four floors were not destroyed, but the top floor was gutted. I just smiled. Ken came to me the next day and told me that the law firm's external server had crashed. All of their data had been lost. Again, I just smiled. A couple weeks later, I had another visitor. It was Gina. She must have talked her mother into bringing her. She came in with the biggest smile I'd ever seen. Gina, I turned to her. You look incredibly happy. What's wrong? I was finally able to finish my surprise for you. You'll never guess what it is. Well, I know from our last conversation that it has something to do with the house in Oak Forest. Don't tell me you and Mom moved there. I know she'd rather live anywhere but there. You're half right, she said. I looked at him puzzled. Mom is being evicted from the Wilmette house, and I'm moving into the Oak Forest house. How can you do that? After all, by court order, she's got primary custody of you until you're of age? I asked. What a surprise. I'm legally an adult. Now I was really puzzled. A. Eh? I've achieved emancipation. That's what Alex and I have been working on for the last two months. Once you put the house in trust, everything fell into place for me. I needed somewhere safe to live, and our old neighborhood is perfect for that. So, let me get this straight. Are you now considered an adult? Yes, when I started having problems with school, mostly because of problems at home, Dr. Hodges helped me solve that problem. Once you get out of here, you can go home. I can't wait to go back to high school in Oak Forest. I've already talked to a lot of my old friends. They can't wait for summer to end and school to start. Mom told me you were spending time with a counselor. I'd like to meet this Alex guy, said I. I still had my doubts that this grown guy was paying that much attention to my daughter. 
Well, you're in luck. Alex brought me here today. Now I was really starting to worry. He's driving her around Chicago? I'll be right back, she said, heading for the door. I needed to assess the situation. How could I tactfully let Alex know that he was crossing a fine line when it came to his intentions for my daughter? I didn't want to upset my daughter, but I wanted to put the fear of God into him. When Gina walked back through the door, she was followed, not by a man, but by a gorgeous woman with raven hair. She smiled at me with a question. How are you doing? I looked at her carefully and said, Freddy? She replied, I haven't heard that name in about 20 years. Freddy, or should I say Alexandria Frederico, was from my neighborhood. She didn't hang out with my gang, but we went to school together. Gina looked at both of us in confusion. Daddy, how do you know Dr. Hodges? Freddie or Alex, as I now realize, answered for me. We lived in the same neighborhood. But he didn't pay attention to me then. I turned to Gina. She was a couple years behind me in school, and we didn't really run in the same circles. And you were a juvenile delinquent back then, she said with a smile on her face. I see you haven't changed much. You're in your 40s now, and you're still in prison. My face reddened, and then I said, I still can't keep my mouth shut when it's appropriate. Looks like it, she said. I heard that I should probably call you Tex? Huh? said Gina. Why do you call him that? That was his nickname when he was a teenager. He was never afraid to retaliate when someone did something bad to him. Your mom definitely did something bad to him, and if I'm not mistaken, I bet the news about the law firm is all Tex is doing. I plead guilty, said I. Before we go any further, I just wanted to say that I hope you don't mind me spending time with Regina. It's Gina, said Regina. Sorry, I forgot, she said. Then she looked at me again and said, When I first started talking to Gina about nine months ago, she was very upset about everything that was going on in her life. I wondered if she was related to you and Ken, since D'Angelo is not a very common last name. When I went through her records and found out that her father's name was Kurt, I still wasn't sure. I always knew you as Tex. When she told me you were in prison, I was sure it was you. I felt really bad then, I admitted. You must have changed and become successful since you have a house in Wilmette, she stated. It's just a house. It's never been my home, I said. Then Gina spoke up. Yes, our real home is in Oak Forest. South side, but in a much better neighborhood than where we grew up, said Alex. Yeah, if we'd stayed there, maybe we wouldn't be where we are now, said I, and then got sad. Perhaps it was true. If Lily had been content in our loving home, we would still be happily married. We talked some more, and then I took Freddie aside and said, I really appreciate you taking time out of your family to help her. Thank you also for helping her become emancipated. It will make all the difference. It's all right, Tex. She's like family to me. I've grown very attached to her. Okay. Thanks again. When you get out of here, you can take us all out to dinner somewhere, she said. I will if I ever get out of here. The next two weeks passed without any new developments, just the daily routine in prison. Gina and Freddie came to visit on Sundays. I was very pleased that Freddie took Gina under her wing. Gina told me that Alex helped her decorate the house. They bought new furniture and other decorations. When I asked where they got the money from, she said, From Uncle Ken, of course, I have money set aside for my needs, right? Yeah, I just didn't want it to come out that Freddie was paying for something. She helped me a lot, but she didn't buy any of it. I hope it's not all girly stuff in there. I'd like to feel at home there. Don't worry, your man cave will still be a man cave. She was talking about the basement. I remodeled it to be a hideout for myself. Living in a house with two women can get boring after a while. You just need somewhere private. When they left, I lay there thinking about how my daughter was growing up. She was an adult now. Soon I would be on my own. In a couple years she would be off to college and then who knows where. I hoped I could meet someone who appreciated the simple things in life. And on Monday I had another visitor, Lily, again. When I saw her I turned around and almost flew back out the door. Then she said, Kurt, wait, we need to talk. I turned around. Now what, I thought. 
Do you know what our daughter did? What are you talking about, Lily? I asked. She went and got emancipation. She doesn't have to live with any of us anymore. In fact, she's already moved out and I don't know where she went. Oh, that, I said. So you know? Did you put her up to it? She accused. No, she did it on her own. The school counselor helped her. So where is she staying at the counselor's? No, she's back home. She moved back to the south side? What about school? She asked. She'll be back in Oak Forest in the fall, I said. She hated that school in Wilmette, Lily. She was always despised for being a kid from the projects, as they called it. She never belonged in high society. You took her out of a school she liked, where she had a lot of good friends, and put her in a situation that hurt her ego and gave her an inferiority complex. By moving her there, you did her more harm than good. I was just trying to make sure she got a good education, she stated. Children learn more from their parents' example than they do in the classroom. We were her teachers of what she would face in life. What do you think your example will teach her? I hope it teaches her what not to do. Our job as parents is to raise law-abiding, responsible adults. I hope we have accomplished that, and I hope she will overlook our failures, especially our marriage. It wasn't that bad, she said. No, but that's how it ended up. Lily, I hope you find what you're looking for. Obviously, I didn't have it. She looked at me. I saw sadness and regret in her eyes. I got up from the table and walked out. I felt sorry for her again. Finally, the day came when I was to be released. This time, I was summoned to the real court. Gina and Freddie were there, as well as Lily. As I sat waiting for the judge, I wondered what he would say this time. I still wasn't going to apologize. The bailiff ordered us to all rise. We stood up as the judge entered. It wasn't the same judge. I wondered if he had lost his job. The judge reviewed all the facts presented to him regarding my situation. Then he looked at me. So, Mr. D'Angelo, what do you have to say for yourself? I hesitated, then said, I guess I should say to myself that I've done my original six months plus two more. At any time, you could have apologized and walked free, he said. I didn't feel the other judge deserved my apology, so I carried out his sentence. You are a stubborn man, Mr. D'Angelo. I prefer to call it strong-willed, and it has helped me succeed in business and in life, I replied. As for your divorce agreement, it remains in effect, and you will have to pay compensation for the months you did not honor it. Then my attorney spoke. Your Honor, my client will gladly pay what he owes. We estimate it to be just under $20,000. He will generously pay her the entire $20,000 today with the understanding that he has met his financial obligations and will not pay her again. With those words, Lily stood up and said, What? You owe me more than that and you have to keep paying me until Regina turns 18. Miss, said the judge, I'll handle all the transactions in my courtroom. Now, counselor, how did you arrive at that figure? Your Honor, my client paid the down payment of spousal support, mortgage and insurance, and gave money for his daughter's support. He continued to pay for his daughter's insurance and maintenance throughout his incarceration. He did not pay his ex-wife's spousal support or mortgage payment because he was not working and could not get a paycheck. Now that he can work again, he can start earning money. The judge looked at the numbers and then said, Your client has been incarcerated for eight months. Spousal support alone will be $16,000, not to mention the mortgage payments. Your Honor, if you read the transcript of the judgment, it says until the minor child becomes an adult. Your Honor, the child in question was emancipated within the last three months, the legal documents are in your possession, and the house was foreclosed on three months ago as well. Thus, there can be no payments on a loan that no longer exists. Therefore, the amount owed is $19,782. He will gladly pay her the full $20,000 and consider his relationship with her terminated in all respects. He looked at the transcript and then back at our figures. He couldn't see how he could get his head around what was written in black and white in front of him. I'll have to look into the matter some more, but if what you've given me is correct, I'll accept that figure. Then he looked at Lily and me and said, You have a child together. Yes, she is an adult from the court's point of view. However, she is still a teenager with teenage issues and needs.
She needs both of you to be civil to each other so she can continue to develop in a healthy way. You all need to be polite to each other. Then, looking directly at me, he said, And you must be civil to others involved in the events that led to your divorce. May I have your word on that, Mr. D'Angelo? Yes, Your Honor, I said. Mrs. D'Angelo, he asked. Yes, Your Honor, she said. And Regina, he said, peering into the gallery. It's Gina, but yes, Your Honor, she said. Then, unless this data proves false, I will close this case, and Mr. D'Angelo, you may go. Thank you, Your Honor, my attorney replied. As we stood up and headed for the exit, Gina ran up to me and gave me a big hug. Freddie stood back with a smile on her face. I saw Lily looking at us as we talked. Then Lily came up to me and said, $20,000? That's it! That's bullshit! Why? You chose your new people over me. They can help you get back on your feet. Son of a bitch, you can't do this to me! Lily, the judge asked us to be civil to each other. Let's do it for Gina's sake. It's Regina, hissed Lily. Our daughter, okay? What am I going to do? I have no job, no place to live, nothing. You can find another job, and as for housing, I can help you. I can put you in one of my apartments, rent-free for six months. That way you can focus on getting your life in order. You want me to move back to the south side? She whined. It's free rent. How can it be wrong? Uh, she exclaimed. I then turned to Gina and Freddy. Ladies, are you ready to go? Of course, they both said. Freddy, I think I owe you a nice dinner. I think I remember something like that, she said. Well, let's go to RPM Italian. I made reservations when I got confirmation of the release date. I really need to cleanse my palate of prison food. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Lily. I could tell she was furious. It was our restaurant. We went there together on special occasions. The table is booked for 6.30, so we have a little time. Do you mind if we ride around a bit? I just need to get used to the freedom, said I. I then turned to Freddy. I made a reservation for four. Could you call your husband and see if he's available? She fell silent, and her face became inexpressive. Then Gina said, Daddy, she doesn't have a husband, not anymore. Then she turned to Alex. I'm sorry, Dr. Hodges, I didn't tell him. I didn't understand. The few times we'd interacted, she'd always worn her wedding ring, and even now she was wearing it. What was I missing? I'm sorry, Freddy, if I've offended you, I offered. No, you shouldn't, you didn't know. My husband was killed on the Eisenhower Highway about five years ago. Some big car changed lanes and drove into the divider. They say he died instantly. I'm sorry, Freddy, I didn't know. I just assumed that since you were wearing rings, you must be married. Yeah, I just can't get them off yet. Somehow I feel like if I do, I'll get them out of my head. I know, psychologist with mental problems. I've heard that before. Well, I'm very sorry. Perhaps you'll join us so I can try to make it up to you? She looked grim but said, I think it's going to be okay. I was so focused on my own problems and revenge that I didn't even ask about her life. I felt like such an ass. I had to change that. Starting tonight, I would be willing to listen to anything she wanted to tell me about who she is now and how she got to this point. I would become a better friend. The food was great. It was so nice to wear regular clothes and not have to worry about always being on guard. The freedom seemed a little strange to me, though. Eight months will do that to you. By the end of lunch, I was feeling better. I took a chance and said to Freddy, Alexandria, when you're ready, will you let me take you out on a real date? I don't care how long it takes when it's convenient for you, but in the meantime, can we stay in touch? Daddy, of course we'll keep in touch. She's not getting rid of me that easily, my daughter said. And I wouldn't want it any other way, Freddie said to Gina. She then turned to me and said, Mike and I never had children since I was in school and he was starting a financial planning business. It just wasn't the right time. So Gina, as a surrogate daughter, has been very therapeutic. I hope you don't mind. After everything you've done for both of us, I wouldn't want it any other way, I stated. As we were leaving the restaurant, Gina said, I hope you like the view of our old house.
Anything would be better than where I've been for the last eight months, I said and chuckled. When we got there, I was surprised. The shutters were painted and the bushes were trimmed. It looked great from the outside, and I couldn't wait to see what was inside. When I went inside, everything looked different than when I left. But I felt more at home than ever before. You could feel Freddy's imprint in here. I know it sounds vulgar, but I cried. This hardened criminal was crying. Kurt? I heard Freddy say. I wiped my eyes and said, I feel at home. Kurt, said Alex. I turned to her and she said, I think I'm ready. I looked at her puzzled. She took off her rings and smiled at me. I couldn't help but smile back, and then we hugged. Epilogue. Ten attorneys, four paralegals, six politicians, and a judge have had their careers and marriages destroyed because of the events leading up to my divorce and its aftermath. Stubbornness or willpower either way, sometimes you have to stand up for your principles. On the other hand, Gina had a new mother and a new brother and sister. Although they were 18 years younger than her when they came into the world, one of them is named Frederick, the boy, and the girl's name is Alexis. They were twins, and I love that I could name them both after the person who helped me start my new life. About Lily? She married a rich lawyer. I think she finally got what she wanted. I thought we had everything. A loving family, a nice house in a good neighborhood, a healthy child, a thriving business that had no money problems. I guess for me we had everything, and for her we lacked only one thing. Status. Now she has status. She's married to a wealthy attorney, living in a big house in Winnet. And she also has a misogynistic husband who doesn't love her, but just keeps her around for the appearance of a stable home life. I hope she's happy. I know she is. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.